السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فأما من خاف مقام ربه ونهى النفس عن الهوى فإن الجنة هي المأوى اللهم ادخلنا في الجنة I want to talk about the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal in this uh, 30 minute or less session that we have together but before I do I want to sh share with you some obstacles that you and I face uh, in, in dealing with this subject in a healthy way first and foremost there are different kinds of people in the audience and obviously within the Muslim community also there are people at different levels in their relationship with Allah there are youth that are maybe here at this conference, my guess is most of them aren't here, that aren't even remotely religiously affiliated. That, you know, as they were coming up, even if they were coming up in a Muslim household, the religion wasn't emphasized that much, and they don't see the need, not even for the Jumu'ah prayer, even on the Fridays that they're off of school. They don't see the need to go. And their parents, as these kids are becoming teenagers and growing a little older, they're starting to feel the need to bring religion into the lives of these children because they realize the impact it's having on their character now than they ever did before. So it's a state of emergency in certain families. That's one kind of person. But another kind of our category of Muslims, especially younger Muslims, are Muslims that had some sort of an awakening. And you started turning towards the religion and one of the things that brought you here to this conference is perhaps maybe you, a lot of you even came without your family. You came on your own, you came with a bunch of friends because you wanted to feel connected to a larger Muslim community. You wanted to be part of or meet with scholars and speakers and feel rejuvenated. It's a, it's a way of refreshing your Iman and I really appreciate that about conferences. At the end of a conference, I've been coming to conferences since I can remember my, my entire adult life. And people complain sometimes, well, you know, in conferences you only get a 20 minute speech or a 30 minute speech and there's too many programs going on. You don't even learn anything because the topics are all over the place. And I always, I've always believed that's not the point. It's the halal party of the year. <laughs> that is what a conference is. So if you're coming here, with friends and you attend, okay, you heard a little bit of good advice. You didn't come here to learn, please don't be offended. Other people have a lot of great wisdom and knowledge to offer. But really guys, you're sitting here half the time you're on your phone. So you're not here to learn, let's be honest with ourselves. We're here to get a little bit of good advice, inshallah ta'ala. Get a good vibe and feel good about being Muslims that, that have come together for something good. And inshallah ta'ala, leave with a positive spirit to do something more with our lives after we leave. And that in and of itself, is a worthy goal. It's a worthy goal. I don't think that the only goal for Muslims is to be to learn. I don't think that. I do think coming together and feeling inspired, I bring my kids every year because I want them to see all kinds of weird Muslims walking around. And they said, that one's Muslim too. And I say, yep, that one too. I want them to feel that. But as we grow in our religion, one of the things that starts happening is we start talking about the problem of the Muslims the problem of the masjid, the problem of the world, the problem of politics, the problem of, you know, da'wah in America, the problem of some brothers and sisters on my college campus who don't do this and don't do that. And brother, I was talking to this one Muslim who doesn't pray, how do I convince him, etc, etc. Problems, 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 and they're usually somebody else's problems, and you're trying to figure out the solution to everybody else's problems. In other words, the more religiously awakened you get after a while, your concerns shift from predominantly being concerns about yourself to concerns about others. You just worry about others as though you have already been resolved. That territory has already been conquered. Now it's time to move on and help somebody else. May Allah help those Muslims brother, those guys from the Pakistan Student Association. Why aren't they in the MSA, the ones that are already one foot into Jannah, you know? Why aren't they there? Why aren't they at the, the neighbor net? Why aren't they at this program or that? Or why aren't they showing at the conferences? What can we do for them? Well, first and foremost, we have to do something for us. And that's what this conversation of fear is about. I'm trying to address all of these different kinds of audiences and there are even more categories. But let me tell you something. The more you're out there in activism and doing things, there's a very natural tendency to forget about yourself. You start getting concerned with the organization that you're serving, with the program that you're putting together, with you know whatever activity, and you start losing yourself in the process. 
At the same time, there's another problem. And this problem is across humanity and Muslims are no exception. You know, there's a certain perception you have of me. Whatever that's based on. But it's not the same perception that my wife or my children have of me. Or, or what my parents have of me. It's not the same perception. They know a side of me you will never know. And I know a side of you that's just partial. We meet each other in public. We say salams to one another. Even if we speak to each other for a little bit, I don't really know you and you don't really know me. But you know what happens when we present ourselves in public and we're out there all the time meeting with people, interacting with society, and we're not by ourselves much. You know what happens? We forget that there is such a thing as also talking to yourself. There is such a thing as being reconnected with yourself. You know, you, you know we represent a certain version of ourselves to the outside world. There's a certain, you know, there's a certain kind of language you're not going to use at an interview. There's going to be a certain kind of tone you're going to take when you're talking to your, your employer or the imam of the masjid or when you have a question with a scholar or something. There's going to be a, a side of you that you're going to present. And when you're among your friends or you're at home by yourself or you're among people that just completely know you, there's a different side of you that comes out. There's a different side of you. But you know what happens for some people? They put that face out for so long, they even forget who they really are. You become so used to presenting your outside, your, this version of yourself to the outside world, you don't even know what it means to look in the mirror anymore. You see someone who's not really there. You're, we're not able to be honest with ourselves. I mean really, how many of us have done the actual exercise of... I know it sounds a little psychotic, but it's healthy. I actually happen to think it's therapeutic to talk to yourself and to be able to say to yourself, here are my shortcomings. Here is what is wrong with me. I tend to have an anger problem. I rush into things. I start things and I don't finish them. I don't give enough attention to one thing. I'm involved in too many things. I have short attention span. I am rude because when somebody's talking to me, I just start talking to somebody else. Or I can't seem to put my phone down. Or I have this addiction online that I can't get rid of. Or I have these friends, when they do the wrong thing, I don't say anything. I become a coward, I don't say anything. I don't even give them sincere advice. Or I have these, you know, these late night hangouts and I keep missing Fajr. When is the last time we actually sat down and said, here is what I would like to change about my life? We're so worried about the world's problems, like we don't have any. And when you forget that you don't have problems, then the only fears you have is for others. You no longer have fears for yourself. What is a surprise then? Then when the dua is being made, when the Quran is being recited, you and I are having a hard time finding a tear to come out of the eye. Because the genuine fear is no longer there. That thought is not running, recurring in our minds. Hope is very powerful, but fear balances it. They, they have to go hand in hand. You can't have one or the other. And so this last session, I want to try to balance the equation. It's not a counter to hope. It's the balancing of that conversation. And it's, an, it's a necessary part of that conversation. Our religion is not fire and brimstone, though it mentions fire and brimstone. And it does that in a very balanced way. <coughs> the other problem we suffer, before we can have a healthy conversation about fear, the additional problem we suffer. One is we just keep presenting this, you know, artificial version of ourselves. Thanks. The other problem is overstimulation. You know, you guys, I'm, I'm, so many of you are addict, addicted to movies, and on top of that, horror movies, and people, you know, they celebrate things that we're supposed to be afraid of. You know, just this morning when we got to the hotel, I was going to put some PBS on for my kids because they like watching some of the shows. And I was going to put like a cartoon on. And the, you know how on the hotel TVs they have the movie trailers? So they had, what is it, Hellraiser or something? Hell something? Hell Rider? I, I can't tell. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Dude's face is on fire. He's riding a motorbike. And he's supposed to be a, a character that you love. Like this guy is awesome. His face is on fire. You know? It's, hell is a joke. Your face on fire is, is entertainment? <laughs> I mean, do you understand how deluded that is? And by the way, I, I can't think of outside a two-year-old. My two-year-old just saw a glance at that and he got scared. But nobody else got scared, which is disturbing. 
It's disturbing that nobody else got scared because now these unusual weird things have become normal for us. Stuff blowing up, people on fire, you guys are playing video games where the headshot is the best shot to take. You know, I got like five headshots in a row bro, slow motion, play that in slow motion, oh snap, that's good. You know, should I turn the blood off or on? No, turn it on bro, turn it on. Turn the blood on, you know. You're not disturbed by that. And then some of you are addicted to these like really, really disturbing, gory horror flicks. And the more bloody and, <coughs> you know, disgusting they are, the more you want to watch them. And on top of that, you're a vegetarian. I don't understand the reconciliation. <laughs> but regardless, it is overstimulated us. And so when the Quran presents a picture of fire, presents a picture of torture and punishment, you're just like, eh, you know, I mean, yeah, it's bad. That's not can't be that bad. We're just overstimulated. There, there's nothing that, that affects us anymore. These words don't have, have an impact on us. And that's a very deep spiritual problem. It's a very deep spiritual problem. Just like, you know, if you have a bad diet, you have a bad diet, you have some very serious physical issues. You have a drain in energy when you're not eating healthy food. You start being tired over very little work. You can and slowly your body starts deteriorating and you're prone to some very serious diseases. Spiritual stagnation is just like that. If you're not taking in a healthy spiritual diet and you're not resisting junk food, junk intake, you know, spiritual poison, if you're not avoiding that, then you're going to have these consequences. And one of its biggest consequences is, at least the one that I see, you know, and I struggle with it myself and I see it in the youth especially, there's no more fear. There's no fear. And actually, even if the religion talks about fear, the first thing we do is complain about it. Like, why is the Quran... This girl came up to me and told me, why does the Quran talk about hell? And this, this girl... Actually, this happened. Of all places in Boston, it happened. She came up to me and she said, you know, I, I used to be a Muslim and I left. And I said, okay, let's talk after the program. And she, she told me, I left Islam because I was reading Surah Al-Rahman. And I was like, okay, well, that's cool. Surah Al-Rahman, the extremely merciful, the unimaginably merciful. She goes, yeah, if God describes himself as so unimaginably merciful, why is it that in the middle of this surah, people are being dragged into hell by their heads being grabbed? Why are they being burned? Why, are they be why is there boiling water, water being poured onto them? يَطُوفُ عَلَيْ you know, يَطُوفُ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ حَمِيمٍ آن يَطُوفُونَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ حَمِيمٍ آن They're going to be going back and forth between boiling water and torture. <laughs> What kind of mercy is this? I don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll place a different order for another surah for you. You know? Because you're not comfortable with the idea. Who's talking to who here? Master is talking to slave. This is not a book that you need to review on Amazon.com that you say, I like most of it, but this hellfire stuff was a little... I give it two stars for that. Because you, you're, you're in a position to judge what is good and what isn't, bad, what isn't good. You know? You're, and you don't like to feel scared. You know, and she said, I, you know, I just couldn't believe that God would create a hell. So I, I don't like fear. I don't like it to the point where if a religion makes me feel it even a little bit, then that religion makes me uncomfortable. Wow. That's your state. That's the position you're in. And by the way, speaking of this surah, before I move on, you should know something about this surah. This, incredibly graphic description of hell that is supposed to scare you and right at the end of it يَقُولُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ Whoever got afraid of standing in front of his master gets two gardens. In other words, I scared you to qualify you for Jannah. The entire point of scaring you was so you can go to Jannah. Even Allah scaring us is a mercy. Even that is a mercy. But this idea of the, you know, I don't want to talk about hellfire. I don't want to talk about judgment day. You know, let's talk about mercy. Allah doesn't let us do one side. He doesn't. Study Quran on your own. Study it. You'll never find a surah that just presents one side of the picture. Allah always balances the equation. And we're naturally supposed to be people that fear Allah Azza wa and do an accounting of ourselves. There are many words in the Quran that describe fear. You know, this is one of the things in the Arabic language when something is important, then they gave it many names. 
When a concept, an item, an object like the sword or the horse, when something was important to Arab tradition, they would give it many names. Fear and emotions, by the way, are a very big part of Arabic literature. So the, the words in the Arabic language for fear are many. And interestingly enough, the Quran uses over a dozen different words just for fear. Just for fear. Khawf, for example, the most common word, La khawfun alayhim, finish the ayah for me because I'm not Egyptian. La khawfun alayhim, wa la hum yahzanun. Khawf. Khawf actually means to see the dangers that are coming and take, to be afraid of what's coming. You know, like a hurricane warning and you're packing your bags and getting out of town? That's khawf. You know, the, the Arab says, خُذِ الْأَمْرَ بِقَوَابِلِهِ Take hold of the matter before, by taking notice of the signs. See the change in the winds and know that trouble's on, on its way. This is khawf. Allah says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّةً Whoever was afraid of standing in front of their master, in other words, they could tell this is coming. They weren't delusional to the fact that it's not coming. This idea, you will not have fear until you realize there's a state of emergency, there's trouble coming. And that's the other huge problem, especially the youth have. I got time bro, I got time to kill. That's why I got Angry Bird and I got like Temple Run on my phone so I could just, because I got time, I got just sitting around. You know, you don't have time. Who told you you have time? Where did that come from? Allah gave you this incredible thing called the intellect so you can fry it playing video games? That's why He gave it to you? So you can watch one episode after the other? What, this is why you were given, you know, what's the difference between you and people who have no purpose in their life? You know, Allah complains about them and says, Did you assume that we've created you without a purpose? Pointless life? That you just got time to kill? You don't have time. And on top of that, the Muslims, subhanAllah. That in and of itself is an indication there's no fear. Entertainment, I don't think is wrong. I personally don't think it's wrong. It's okay. Entertain yourself, but know some limits, guys. Put some limits on it. It's like once you start, you can't stop. You know, and that's an indication that you're not afraid of its consequences. There's khawf. There's al-khashya. Al-khashya, Allah says, فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي You know, Khashya literally in Arabic means when you're afraid of the evil of something. The harm that will come to you from something. I'm afraid of a snake, it's a kind of a khashya. It's a kind of khashya. Because I'm afraid of its poison, its bite. That's khashya. Allah told us specifically, for example, don't be afraid of people or what they're capable of doing to you. Even if they have that capability. Look, the fear of a snake is a logical fear. It's not, it's not something wrong. Even Musa salam, up on the mount was afraid of the snake. It's natural. It's not like there's a lack of iman there. You're a normal human being. And by the way, that tells us something else. Fear is a necessary instinct for survival. It's not something negative in and of itself. A child that does not have fear has a problem because he will jump out the window. He will go take the step down the stairs even though he can't handle it. Because there's no, no fear. The smart child will taste that once and then the next time it will back off. Even the smarter child will see his little brother go and say, okay, you know what, I'll wait for mama. <laughs> you know? That's, that, that's, that's just child psychology. So what does Allah tell us? Here's, the, here's a bunch of people that fell off a cliff before you. You want to go down that road? You want to taste it for yourself? And what do we do? Dumber than a child. Yeah, let's try it. Was how bad could it be? I'm going to be the exception. I'm going to be the one that jumps out the window and is going to float. Watch. We are, there are no exceptions. The only, whoever tries to wrestle the truth, wrestle the inevitable, gets wrestled and pinned themselves. There is no way. Fear is a healthy thing. In its place. In its place. But I want to talk to you about this other kind of fear. There's a few, there's so many words in the Quran for fear, I can't possibly go through all of them with you. But a couple more. Al-Khushu'ah Which is usually associated with concentration and humility in the prayer But has an element of fear in it Khushu'ah has an element of fear in it And some scholars even argue it's the element of fear that goes from your heart and starts affecting your limbs You're so afraid you start feeling it in your muscles Your muscles start getting soft You start feeling a tingle That kind of fear <coughs> That's Khushu'ah when is khushu' experienced? You guys already know the answer to that. When is that kind of fear, among other things, experienced in the life of a Muslim? Where does khushu' happen? In salat. Allah says, Alam yani lil ladina amanu an takhsha'a kulubuhum li dhikrillah fi surat al-hadid. 
57 surah, he says, isn't it time for believers yet that their hearts should be filled with awe, they should be overwhelmed by the fear of Allah, by the, by the mention of Allah, by the, by the remembrance of Allah, meaning by the Quran. A genuine recitation of the Quran, not to perfect your tajweed, which is important, not to study tafsir, which is important, not to understand the Arabic language, which is important. A genuine recitation of the Quran, you're just sitting there because you want to know what Allah is saying to you. That, that's the only reason you're reading it. It's not ilm, it's not muraja'a, it's not review for your hifz, it's not none of those things. Those are all great things. But there has to be a time when you sit and recite Quran and the only reason you're doing it is because you need therapy. That's the only reason you're doing it. And when that happens, you will experience khushu'a. And that when you get mature in that, then that is supposed to happen inside salat. That's when it's supposed to happen. But if you have to build up to that point, it should even happen outside. You just sit and recite Quran and let Allah Azza wa Jal overwhelm you with His words because they are overwhelming. They are very powerful words. It's no small thing. And Allah complains, hasn't, it time, hasn't, hasn't the time come yet? That their hearts over, aren't overwhelmed with emotion because of what Allah has revealed? Are these words aren't powerful enough? You know, these same words, if they fell upon a, a, a mountain, the first reaction for the mountain, khashi'an. And a mountain is just solid rock. It's just rock. And yet that rock experiences internal change because of the word of Allah. And then it can't handle it, mutasaddi'an. How much harder than that rock does a heart have to be that it hears the word of Allah and nothing happens? How much harder? That Allah has to complain in the Quran. What is going on? How come these words aren't having their impact? Don't, don't worry about it guys. I have like 8 minutes left. I'll take less than that. Okay. Now I want to talk to you about just a couple more fears. Two very common words that are associated with fear. That actually they're related to each other. One of them, even though it doesn't technically mean fear, is taqwa. And I think all of you know the term taqwa, right? You've heard it before. And a lot of times in the Quran, when taqwa is translated, it's translated as fear. But just from a linguistic point of view, taqwa essentially is a fear or actions taken out of fear, precaution, protecting yourself. It comes from wiqaya, which literally means protection. So when you lock the, the house as you leave, that's taqwa. If you're going on a road trip and you left a couple of lights on on purpose, and you set the alarm, or you told the neighbor, or you left the keys with a friend or whatever, all of that's taqwa. In other words, you took proper precaution to not get yourself into trouble. Taqwa is before the fact. Taqwa is before the fact. In other words, you don't want to get yourself into trouble. You don't want to, you know, get, get a ticket, so you slow down before the red light comes. That's taqwa. In other words, it's a genuinely healthy, logical attitude for someone who knows there's trouble out there. That's what Allah Azza wa wants from us. Just become awake, aware, conscious people. Be aware of your environment. Know that this thing is going to land you into trouble. It's, I, I remind you something about taqwa that I want to share with you. Allah Azza wa Jal did not tell us or tell, tell Adam alayhi salam, don't eat from the tree. لا تأكلا من هذه الشجرة. Don't eat from the tree. He didn't say that. فقال لا تقرب هذه الشجرة. Don't go near the tree. Now, the next part of the ayah is لا تقربا هذه الشجرة فتكونا من الظالمين Don't eat from the tree Don't go near the tree rather You'll become from the wrongdoers But there's a step in between Don't go near the tree If you do go near the tree As a result you'll get tempted by the fruit Then you will eat the fruit Then a whole bunch of, And then eventually you'll be from, counted among the wrongdoers There's a whole process But as far as Allah is concerned And His knowledge of human nature is concerned Because He knows what He created He says once you're within the gravitational force You get close enough You will get sucked in So there, if Adam salam was told that You my brother cannot say Nah B I can handle myself I got this it's not haram, is it? It's just like almost haram. You can't do that. Because now you're, you're within the gravitational field. You have to be afraid of the fences and even beyond. You have to stay out of the neighborhood. You got to stay away. You can't even go near it. This is a very powerful thing Allah taught us. Not just to fear Him, but to fear the things that lead us to sin. 
to be afraid of the things that lead you to sin. You're heading in the wrong direction. You're not doing anything wrong yet, but I could see where this is leading. So stop. Let me give you guys a little bit of an example just so this is not entirely theoretical. So sister comes up to me and says, or the brother comes up to me and says, this uh, Christian girl in college is asking questions about Islam and she's asking about God. Or Muslim girl comes up to me and says, this, you know, this guy in my college class, he's asking a lot about God and he has these questions. Could you help me answer them? Because he keeps arguing with me. Lady, sister, he's not arguing with you because he has a theological concern because those questions have well been answered online and there's plenty of resources on that available he just wants to spend some more time with you and maybe deep down inside you already know that but you come and you say no 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 I'm trying to give him da'wah to Islam and you say I'm gonna help this sister out she's a sister inshallah you know I want to help her out and we're just gonna meet at Starbucks and discuss Tawheed that's what we're going to do. I mean, this is Dawah to Islam. And then maybe one day, you know, it's not Ramadan yet. So yeah, inshallah ta'ala, right after between Maghrib and Isha, I'm going to take her to this displaced this restaurant. It's a halal restaurant. We're going to do our, our totally halal Dawah. And somebody says, brother, what are you doing? I was like, are you eating, eating food at a restaurant, bro? Is that haram? You know, it's talking about Allah haram. No, but I could see where this is going. And then four months later, bro, there's a sister. She's ready to convert. And I want to marry her. Is she really ready to convert? No, but I think she might. How do I convince my parents? Yeah. And what you're not, and, and this is the halal version of what you tell the Imam. <laughs> what happened in between, we all know. We all, we're not dumb. Okay? I was in college too once. I know how this stuff goes. And when you question the guy, you question the girl, you say, What are you talking about? Stuff, I would never. Really? You would never? <laughs> You get, you get sucked in, you don't even realize it. One thing leads to another. One thing leads to another. You have to be afraid of these things. And this will never happen. I'm going back to the beginning of my conversation. You will not be afraid of these problems if you don't really know who you are. If you're delusional about yourself. If you think that everybody else has a problem, you're here to save the world. You're, you're here to give them Islam. If that's what your mentality has become, then you will never think that you have a nafs problem too. You have shahawat also. You have the waswasa of shaitan too. You won't even be worried about that. And by the way, I'll, I'll end with this, this last two kinds of fear. As I said, taqwa is before the fact. You take precautions ahead of time. And then after that, there's wajal. Al wajal. Wajal is after the fact. You're afraid of what you've done. You're afraid of what you, you've done something wrong and you're super scared, man, I'm going to get caught. I don't know what's going to happen. I just, I, I did this, bro. I don't know. I got to talk to this imam. I got to send him a brother. I've done this really terrible thing. What should I do? I'm really scared. I can't tell you how many of those emails I have to delete. Don't send me those emails. Talk to a counselor. Talk to a counselor. I mean, I, ask me Arabic questions, okay? But this is wajil is after the fact. So Allah says, إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ When Allah is mentioned, when Allah is remembered, their hearts start trembling out of fear over what they have already done. In other words, standing in salat, reciting Quran, khushur, and wajil. Wajil meaning your heart starts getting overwhelmed. Man, Allah Azza wa Jal says, just said, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّهُ مُعْرِضُونَ They stay away from useless conversation. I just finished one. Oh! They're constantly trying to cleanse themselves. I just finished watching some filth. Oh, strike two. I am afraid of what just happened. You're supposed to get afraid. You're supposed to be a muhasaba of yourself. This is wajal. But the last kind of fear. Last kind of fear. That's very, I find this fascinating. Of the many kinds of fear, I just want to talk to you about this one. Uh, uh, this is called ar-rahab. Ar-rahab. Ra-ha and ba. From it we get the word rahbaniyya. Ruhban, Rahbaniya. Rahbaniya in Arabic means basically a, 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 like a monk lifestyle where you have you, you don't want any pleasures of the world. You want nothing to do with them. You know how these monks, they dress in uncomfortable clothes and they sleep on like the floor and they don't eat fruit because it might taste good or something, you know. They just don't, they don't want anything to do with worldly pleasure. They want to deny them all of that. But from that deriv derivation, you get one of the words for fear. And that word for fear particularly is used for the Israelites. In one case, for example, Be afraid only and only of me. 
Rahab is used. The question arises, why? Some of our ulama commented on the word Rahab here. They said the, the problem of Bani Israel began with self-righteousness. They, they were self-righteous. They assumed they got it all figured out. Everybody else has the problem. As a result of their self-righteousness, they stopped fearing Allah. And when they stopped fearing Allah, they weren't, they, even their motivation for Jannah was gone. When the fear of hell goes, next thing to go is what? Motivation for Jannah. One motivation dies, the other motivation dies. And if no longer there is, there's no longer a fear of fire, and there's no longer a motivation for paradise, then the only motives you have left are here. Now listen to this, Look at, listen to this catch. Ar-Rahab, I told you Rahbaniya, otherworldliness. Yeah, otherworldliness. Rahab is a kind of fear that makes you lose the pleasures of this world. When you have that fear, you want nothing, you forget all the pleasures of this world. They were so immersed in worldly pleasure and they were so engrossed in it, the kind of fear Allah wants from them is the one that negates their addictions. The one that removes them. So He says, فَإِيَّايَا farhabun." This is the state you've reached. It's one of the most terrifying states of fear in the Arabic language. You're so afraid that nothing good comes in your head. You're completely overwhelmed in your fear. Allah used that word specifically for a people that were so deeply engrossed in this world because their motivations for the Akhirah were gone. Their motivations were gone. My final comment, I know it's Salat time. My final comment about this issue, how to, one of the ways to reconcile hope and fear, you know, is in the life of a Muslim, maybe your first entrance into Islam was something that scared you. Maybe it was a, a fear. For me personally, it was. One of the things that brought me back to the deen was fear. It really was. Maybe the primary thing that brought me back was fear. But that is a, you know how you ever heard of the scared straight program? <laughs> right? It's a healthy thing. That's not the only relationship I have with Allah. That's not the only relationship you're going to have with Allah. But it might be a healthy start. And then eventually that fear will turn into a balance of fear and hope and eventually grow into love. It'll evolve and this emotion will have, this, this relationship will have developed multiple dimensions. But that takes time. So don't be afraid to be afraid. <laughs> be fearful of Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow that fear to enter into our hearts, a healthy fear of Allah. And may Allah Azza wa Jal give us that balanced fear that we should have of Him and of the hudud that He has set of us. May Allah make us afraid of disappointing Him. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us afraid of doing less than we are supposed to do. And may Allah Azza wa Jal really put a genuine fear of Him in our most personal moments. When we are away from everybody else, so that we can truly experience the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal in our lives. Barakallahu li wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.